Welcome back to the Warbird Mistress. Today is the 14th of December, 1941, and this is A Walk Through the War. We begin today in the American Theater of Operations in the Zone of the Interior. The 106th Observation Squadron, 66th Observation Group, transfers from Birmingham, Alabama to Miami at what would soon be Miami Army Airfield, incidentally the birthplace of Pan Am. Uh, they use O-47s and O-49s, and they begin flying ASW patrols. The 107th Observation Squadron of the 67th Observation Group transfers from Camp Beauregard, Louisiana, to Charleston Army Airfield, South Carolina, and they also fly anti-submarine patrols. Moving to the West Coast, in the 4th Air Force, the 41st Pursuit Squadron Interceptor of the 31st Pursuit Group Interceptor begins flying ASW patrols with Bell P-39 Air Cobras from Painfield, Washington, along the Salish Sea, about 25 miles north of Seattle. The hottest action, of course, is still in the Pacific. In the Southwest Pacific Theater of Operations, the Far East Air Force launches four B-17s of the 19th Bomb Group from Del Monte Field in Tonkulan, Bukidon, on Mindanao, against the Japanese beachhead at Legaspi, Luzon. Jumped by 18 Japanese fighters, likely Zeke's, the real hero in the story to come out of it is First Lieutenant Hewitt T. Wellis. Wellis was the pilot, Lieutenant Taborek co-pilot, Ninog the navigator, uh, Sergeant Chalette was the bombardier, Sergeant Brown the sun gu side gunner, Sergeant Goody the other side gunner, Private Killen was the top gunner and radio operator, along with Corporal Williams. Now, why these names are important is because there is a story and the characters in it are really some of the, one of the unsung groups of heroes, but it is, again, today in the war. So it's very early and heroes are very rare. Approximately 10 minutes from their targets, the B-17 started to descend out of the overcast sky and they garnered the attention of wave after wave of Japanese fighters. While Sergeants Brown and Guti opened up on the lateral guns and each downed a Zeke in quick succession, the radio operator, Private Killen, went down to the gondola to replace Corporal Williams, who was being sent to unjam the dorsal guns. Killen caught a burst from a Zeke just as he was entering and was killed instantly. Another Zeke took out the number two engine and severed the throttle cable. The others made pass after pass, but the gunners kept up their fire and got one Zeke after the other. Williams, by the dorsal gun, was hit by a 20mm cannon shell, which tore up his hip and nearly tore his right leg off of the thigh. Yet despite the pain and trauma, he stayed at his gun. Pressing on along the shoreline, they unloaded their 4,800 pounds of bombs and claimed six Japanese transports. Turning from the target and trying to gain altitude, the overcast sky that had given them so much cover on the way in was breaking up. Number three engine was damaged and 20mm cannon shells tore through the wing of the fuselage. Quellis could only control the cables for the right rudder, the ailerons, and the left elevator. With each patch of cloth, the men could reload the guns during those brief seconds of respite and prepare for the next wave of fighters. Machine gun bullets tore through the instrument panel as one cannon shell exploded in the radio and another behind the petrol tank for number four engine. Next, Goody's hand was mangled and nearly severed by machine gun fire. Brown operated both waist guns while Goody, his hand kept on only by his glove and what strands of flesh remained, assisted him as best he could. After another Zeke took out the sights of one of the waist guns and put a round through Brown's wrist, the two had to work as a team to defend the plane in the blood-soaked quarters, downing more zeros with every pass. With the dorsal gun still jammed and Killen's limp body stuck in the gondola, Ninog, the navigator, assisted the two waist gunners as best he could, while in the nose, Sergeant Chalette sat helplessly watching the Japanese attack from the sides and tail, no fighter entering his arc of fire. After zigzagging between patches of cloud for 75 miles, the Japanese stopped the attack. Wheelers presumed they were out of ammunition, although as the A6M2 only had 60 rounds for each 20mm gun and 500 rounds for each 7.7mm gun, it may be that the Japanese spent most of that time finding out how limited rifle caliber guns were against American aircraft, even ones largely unarmored. Wellis described the plane as awash with blood. Despite that, in the end, Private Killen, the radio operator, was the only one to lose his life. Two engines out, a third damaged, the plane shut up, no instrument panel, no throttle control, inoperable trim tabs, oil pressure dropping, all but four control cables snapped, no fine controls, petrol leaking. He still managed to fly 350 miles back to base. It was dark when they arrived over the field. 
with flat tires on both front wheels and his tail wheel blasted off, Well has faced yet another obstacle, or rather many. Parade Field at Cagayan had been covered with rocks of all sizes and any other obstacle they could drag up to prevent Japanese troops from taking advantage of an open airfield. Dodging them as best he could, Wellis lowered his ruined landing gear and managed to crash land as safely as possible for the benefit of his men. As ambulances and staff cars managed to cart away the wounded crew, the plane was pushed aside and covered in foliage to disguise her position from the observation and attention of Japanese bombers. As the Japanese advanced several days later, Corporal Williams would escape the sick bay to meet up with others from the 19th Bombardment Group and would become one of the members of the ad hoc unit called the American Guerrilla of Mindanao. However, his wounds, still heavy with shrapnel, refused to heal and he would be evacuated by the USS Narwhal to recover in Australia as his time in the war came to an end. Wellis, who only spoke of his crewmate's bravery in surgery and interviews and was humble to a fault, would receive the Distinguished Service Cross and eventually rise to command a bomb group. The story would even be told in the 1942 film Beyond the Line of Duty, narrated by future President Ronald Reagan. In typical early war short-subject fashion, he was defended by guns with no recoil from a mix of stock photos, stukas, model aircraft, and what appeared to be firecrackers on a string. Not that anyone cared when stories of heroism were rare, and any good news was worth repeating. That was the 14th of December, 1941. This is Claire, and I am the Warbird Mistress. Thank you and take care.